What is a catamorphism? The definition on Wikipedia isn't very helpful. It's the kind of definition that's useful when you already know the answer. And it says that uh, in category theory, it's the unique homomorphism from an initial algebra into some other algebra. And in functional programming, it's the generalization of folds of lists to arbitrary algebraic data types. And this is the kind of definition that's only useful after you've already gained understanding of the subject. But if you haven't got already some understanding of the subject, then this video is for you. And in this video, we'll try to show by example what a catamorphism actually is. So first we'll show a couple of examples of actual catamorphisms. And then we'll see what these examples have in common. And then we'll abstract over the commonalities. And doing so will help us understand what a catamorphism is. Um, we will start with some kind of a initial working definition. And that is uh, that a catamorphism is a particular type of recursive function over a recursive data structure. So first let's think a little bit about what it means for a data structure to be recursive. Um, well, for the type of a data structure to be recursive, that simply means that it is expressed in terms of itself. Let's give an example of this. So first we have a list, um, and a list is either uh, uh, nil, or it is a cons followed by some value, and then another list. So this is a recursively defined data type, because for the case of the cons, um, one of the fields is a list. And that's exactly the thing we're defining. So the thing is defined in terms of itself. And as a second example of a recursively defined data type, um, let us define a small expression language. Um, and in this uh, small expression language that we just made up, um, an expression is either one of the following. It's either a lit, which has a field which is an int, or it is an add, of two further expressions, or it is a sub of two further expressions. And of course, uh, this data type uh, definition suggests a certain semantics uh, for us uh, normal people, because we see add and sub and we think, oh, it must be about subtraction and addition. Of course, just defining the data type doesn't actually introduce those semantics yet. Um, and it is a recursively, data, uh, recursively defined data type because for two of the cases, namely uh, add and sub, um, two of these fields are again expert. And this expert is the same as uh, the name of the data type itself. And for one case, of course, it's not so. Uh, in the case of lit, uh, there is no further recursion. As a final example of recursive data type, we'll give uh, the example of an S expression. And an S expression is either an atom or is a list of S expressions. So let's take a look at some examples for such recursively defined types. And uh, for a list, an example could be the following. A cons of one and another list, and this other list is cons of seven and another list, and the other list is nil. And if we want, we can also draw this as a picture, and then it looks like this. A cons of one and another list, cons of seven and nil. So we can do the same for our expression language. We have the following. And we can draw this as a picture as well, and then it looks like this an add of a sub of a lit 7 and a lit 3 and going back to the add a lit 4. Okay, now we'll look at a couple of examples of recursive functions over such recursively defined types. And uh, we'll start with this uh, uh, simple expression type expert that we saw. And all of these functions will be pure functions, no side effects, and there will be functions uh, from a recursively defined type to any type. And of course, they'll happen to be uh, catamorphisms as well. Uh, it's kind of the point. So the first of these uh, we'll just call count. 
and it counts the total number of expressions inside any given expression. So for the example that we just saw, uh, we can uh, just manually count first to make sure we have a reference. And then we see that we have one, two, three, four, five expressions in total in this root expression. And of course we can define this uh, function recursively and we do it like so. For a lit, the answer to how many expressions are recursively defined or contained in this expression is simply one. It's only the lit, no further recursion. And for both of the other two cases, the answer is one plus the number of expressions that are contained in both sub-expressions. So add contains two expressions and uh, the total uh, number of expressions inside an add is uh, the total number in both of these plus one for the add itself. And we can apply the same trick for sub. And if we write that down in Haskell, uh, we see this. So if we draw a picture, it looks like this. Um, first, we call count on the uh, root expression. And uh, the root expression is an add expression. So we first need to uh, check both of the uh, sub-expressions of that add expression um, and count them. So we do that first for sub. So for sub, we have to count both sub-expressions again. So then we end up here. Okay, we count it, it's a lit, so that's one. We end up here, it's a lit, that's one. And then uh, we add to those two ones another one for the sub itself and return three. And uh, we uh, go into the other branch. Um, we see that it's a lit, we get a one, and we add up the three, the one, with the one for add itself, and that makes a total of five. And uh, the second example of a recursive function that we'll look at uh, is something that we call evaluation or eval, and it corresponds to the semantics that are uh, kind of already suggested by the names of the data constructors. So we do what is basically a case expression on the constructor. If it's a lit, then the answer is A, if it is add, then we add them. If it is sub, then we subtract, uh, subtract one uh, from the other. And when I say one from the other, I mean the rec recursive evaluation of one is subtracted of the recursive evaluation of the other. And here we see that we can construct the call graph for eval uh, by taking the one from count and uh, replacing the return values. Um, so, so far the examples have uh, both been catamorphisms, that's not entirely surprising. Um, and now we're going to take a closer look at what these examples have in common. And it turns out that what they have in common is uh, the shape of the recursion or uh, the recursion scheme. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to factor that commonality out. And by uh, factoring it out, we'll be uh, left with two pieces, namely first the recursion scheme that they both have in common. And second, uh, for each of them, we'll have something that they don't have in common. We'll have something that's particular to each of those, or for, for each of the examples. And by uh, doing that refactoring, we'll uh, gain two things. Uh, we'll gain uh, better code. Uh, so. Uh, it's generally a good idea to uh, reuse things that are the same. Uh, so it's a generally useful trick. Um, but in the context of this uh, video, we also gain understanding of what a catamorphism is. So now we're going to abstract over the recursion scheme. And uh, we're going to approach this uh, uh, abstraction or this refactoring from the opposite side, so to say. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these function definitions and say, what would the function definition look like if it wasn't allowed to be recursive? And of course, that uh, immediately introduces a problem uh, because we have recursively defined data. 
uh, and to get the answer uh, over such a recursively defined data, we need this recursive answer. Um, to solve this problem, we're going to use a design, de design technique called wish working, and that is we're going to just assume that that uh, problem has already been solved and that the answer is now contained at the locations where there was previously a recursively defined data structure. And uh, by doing that, we'll end up with the non-recursive essence of each of the functions. So for the case of lit, of course, nothing changes. Uh, lit values don't actually recursively contain expressions. Um, but for the other two values, uh, sorry, for the other two cases, something does change. And uh, what happens is we just remove the recursive call to count. And we assume that the value contained in the fields that were previously recursive uh, is now containing the answer to our recursive question. And uh, note that in a statically typed language like Haskell, which is the language of our examples, um, we cannot directly apply this trick without thinking about the types. Uh, in the uh, type definition of expert, uh, the, the things contained at the points A and B or are further experts but the rewritten expressions contain the answers to our recursive question. So the re rewritten um, expressions contain ints there. And for now, we'll just work around that by introducing a new but similar type, x per f, which has the constructors lit f, at f, and sub f. And of course, that is of the correct, correct type. And we do that by making x per f polymorphic, um, so it's parameterized by the type of the answers, the answers to the recursive question, that is. And we call the resulting function, resulting from this rewrite, an algebra. And there's a good reason to do that from category theory, but for the purposes of this video, we won't go into that uh, reason. Uh, it's just a name, and you can just hear algebra and then um, mentally think, Oh, that's a function that was previously in this recursive shape. But now it's rewritten in a way that assumes that the recursive problem has been solved. Now, if we want to take a look at this one uh, graphically, uh, of course, it's no longer a nice recursive tree because we've just gotten rid of the recursion. So for each of the uh, things that were previously containing recursive fields, now we can see that there's just answers there. And if we look at, uh, so this is the one that's for counting, but of course we can do the same thing for eval. Okay, until now we've just thrown out the recursion and we've assumed that the problem of uh, reintroducing it would solve itself. But of course problems don't actually solve themselves. We solve problems. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna solve this problem of reintroducing the recursion. But luckily, now that we've factored out these algebras, we have created a clear goal for ourselves. Um, we can try to figure out what the function looks like that when we feed it one of these algebras, gives us this catamorphism that we had before. And the answer is a function that we'll call kata expert. So again, we'll use a particular example, in this case, the function count, and refactor our way towards the answer. And we'll start simply by renaming count into kata expert. And the next step is to create a parameter for this function, the algebra. Uh, this is simply because the thing that we are looking for shouldn't itself contain the algebra, it should be passed into it. Okay, so now we see that there's still a number of references to count and that can't work because we've just renamed count. So we're just gonna get rid of those and replace them also with calls to kata expert else. Now, so far we've just renamed starting with our example count, but uh, the basis that we started with still contains all these uh, references to the original algebra. So we need to get rid of those as well. And after having gotten rid of them, 
we need to restore the idea of uh, calling an algebra. Uh, luckily, we've been passed an algebra, so we can just do that. And we need to do this in a way that the types match, of course. And the algebra that we constructed takes as its input something of type x per f. So for each of these calls of the algebra, we need to get the correct x per f um, passed into it. And, uh, and we use the matching type constructors. So on a uh, lit on the left hand side, we use lit f on the right hand side. And add on the left hand side, we use add f on the right hand side, etc. And finally, we show here what the type is of this function. So it takes an algebra, which is itself a function of x per f a into a. Then it takes an expression and returns an a. So at this point, we have actually achieved quite a lot. We've split out our function kata x per. And uh, we can now use this function to take any algebra that operates on the x per f and uh, turn it into a catamorphism. In other words, we've managed to isolate our recursion scheme. But we have done this in a way that is still specific to x per and x per f. So naturally, the next question is whether we can abstract over those things as well. And of course, the advantage of doing so would be that we don't have to write some version of Catra something for each data type that we have. So let's try to construct this generic version of Kata. And before we can do that, we have to return to our types, because so far we've been quite ad hoc about this. Uh, when we were constructing the algebra for count, we just created a type that we needed, x per f, and we just did that ad hoc. That is, we basically copied the uh, definition of x per and added f's everywhere. But now the question is, can we express x per in terms of x per f more directly? And the answer to that question is that yes, we can indeed do that. And the key observation here is that x per f is simply a type that contains something else. And on the other hand, x per is a type that contains x pers. So all we need to do is to have x per f's infinitely contain further x per f's. Of course, if we actually try to write that down naively, so to say, we run out of paper. So what we need is a so-called fixed point type constructor, something that we can pass a non-recursive type and then get a recursive type for it in return. And here we won't attempt to derive that, we'll just present it in Haskell. And the key is, of course, that f is being applied to fix f. And using this type constructor, we can uh, construct x per out of x per f, which was our goal to begin with. And here we can see that we can also actually construct values of this uh, x per type. So to construct an x per value for lit f5, we simply wrap it in in once. And for add, we need to wrap the add expression in such an in, but also each of the literals. Uh, of course, you can also see here that it becomes a little bit more clumsy than in our original uh, presentation of x per because we need to add this in constructor uh, in many places. Finally, we note that there exists a function called unfix, which takes the value of the recursive type and returns the uh, associated value from the non-recursive type. And it does this simply by peeling away one in constructor. So now we can return to our task, which was to turn kata expert into an even more generic thing, kata. But having returned to kata expert, we first need to uh, fix up the type, so to say. We just changed uh, what expert looks like and expressed expert in terms of expert f. So we need to fix up the types here in kata expert to match that. And we do that simply by matching on uh, the in constructor on the left hand side and adding the appropriate 
F everywhere. And by doing this, we've also gained a certain symmetry in our function definition. We now have sub f on the left and sub f on the right, add f on the left, add f on the right, etc. And returning once more to the definition of x per f can help us in identifying a final pattern, namely the following. We said that x per f is a container of something, and of course in functional programming, container of something should make us think of a functor. And, uh, well, quick examination shows that indeed this is a functor. And that should be obvious from the instance definition as given here. Uh, we can, of course, also use the appropriate pragma, which is derived functor in Haskell. And now, armed with fmap, we can rewrite all of this into a single line, like so. So what we see here first in purple is that we, uh, or rather underlined in purple, is that we have replaced the pattern matching on all kinds of functors with uh, a single pattern matching on the functor f. And uh, second, that we've replaced all the stuff that's underlined in green, uh, which is a recursive application of kata expr elk inside this functor with fmap of kata elk um, on the functor. And finally, if we want, we can replace the pattern matching of in f with the application of unfix. Remember, unfix is the thing that we can uh, give a value of the recursive type to and get a, a flat, uh, unrecursive uh, type for in return. So by writing a kata expr as a single line, uh, we have, of course, uh, made it much uh, shorter, which is always good, uh, generally good. Uh, but we've also made it uh, more general, which was our goal to begin with. So uh, the version of Kata, uh, it's now been renamed to reflect this, by the way, the version of Kata that's uh, at the bottom uh, can be used for any of these recursive data types that is constructed using the fix and that contains an F, uh, a functor inside. And note, by the way, that this thing is called kata. It's not itself a catamorphism, but it's the thing that produces catamorphisms out of algebras. So in the beginning of this video, I said that uh, catamorphism is a particular kind of recursive function over a recursive data structure. And now that we factored out the scheme of recursion from the examples, we can see more clearly what type of recursive function we're talking about. Uh, because it, we're talking about the recursive functions that been, can be created by applying some algebra to kata. So some things to note are that first kata is just f mapping on each level. So each point of recursion of the data type is treated as a point of recursion for the recursive function. And the second thing to note here is that there is no flow of information uh, uh, down into the recursive applications. So uh, each time a recursive uh, function is called, it's just called uh, on the data, but no other information flows there. And uh, we can also see that when we look at the diagrams, uh, we can see that the, arrow, the, the only annotations to arrows are on the, uh, are on the arrows pointing back up. So the, we can see that the data only flows from bottom to top. Of course, we can't just call this bottom-up recursion because even though the data flows from bottom to top, the recursion itself, the call graph itself, flows from top to bottom. So bottom-up by itself is a confusing term. So that uh, concludes our discussion of catamorphisms. So what we've tried to do in this video is by splitting out the recursion scheme and the algebra, gain some insight into what the recursion scheme is. And we then call functions which follow that recursion scheme catamorphisms. So 
Thinking about this in a more abstract way has a number of advantages. First, we can now use this generic function kata whenever we have a catamorphism. Uh, so it's just a general uh, advantage of code reuse. And uh, in general, we have advantages such as we only have to implement this once. We, we already did that. And if we have any proofs about it or any kind of reasoning about it, we only have to think about it once. Um, so that's uh, general advantages. And in this case, um, there's a, a couple of more advantages, for example, uh, in the context of parallelization. By definition of catamorphism, we know that the calculations in various branches of the tree do not depend on each other. The only flow of data is up, so the only dependency in terms of calculations is also in that direction. And this means that we can do these computations uh, entirely uh, separately, even on separate computers, for example. And finally, in the context of uh, changing data, uh, we have a similar advantage. Changes in one part of uh, the recursive data structure don't affect other parts of the recursive data structure. And if we know that, we can optimize for it. I hope that was useful, and if you have any comments, leave them below.